Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome back to another Tuesday of uh, cardiovascular medicine grand rounds. Um, we have uh, Dr. Posick uh, here today uh, talking about the uh, transition to high sensitive high sensitivity troponin. Um, I think it's best that we get started uh, so that way we have enough time to get through this and also time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Steve Posick. I am a non-invasive cardiologist at the Yale University School of Medicine and a medical director for care signature at Yale New Haven Health. Thank you for joining me for cardiology grand rounds this morning to discuss the upcoming transition to high sensitivity troponin at Yale New Haven Health. We will have three speakers today. Dr. Joe Curry is an associate professor of laboratory medicine at Yale University School of Medicine and Director of Clinical Chemistry and Lab Medicine at Yale New Haven Hospital. Dr. Stuart Zarich is an Associate Professor of Clinical Medicine at Yale University School of Medicine, Chairman of Cardiovascular Medicine, and Associate Chairman of Internal Medicine at Bridgeport Hospital. I will present the care signature pathways related to my sensitivity component. Many thanks to the Yale New Haven High Sensitivity Troponin Steering Committee, which consists of many representatives from all delivery networks as well as the clinical consensus group responsible for the care signature pathways we will review later in our discussion. This is not an exhaustive list. Many other individuals have contributed to this broad system-wide effort. Dr. El Curry will begin with a brief introduction to the lab characteristics of high sensitivity troponin. Dr. Zarich will then provide more detailed background and discussion regarding the use and interpretation of high sensitivity troponin. And I will close with a review of the care signature pathways for the evaluation of chest pain in the emergency department and inpatient units. As the name implies, high sensitivity troponin assays are extremely sensitive and can detect very small levels of troponin well below the lower limits of previous assays. They are also very precise and allow the accurate detection of very small changes. High sensitivity troponin is detectable in over 50% of healthy individuals. Levels that exceed the 99th percentile for a normal reference population are considered abnormal, but are not diagnostic for an acute myocardial infarction. As outlined in the fourth universal definition of myocardial infarction, the diagnosis of AMI requires a rising or falling troponin with at least one value exceeding the 99th percentile and clinical context suggestive of ischemia, such as symptoms, diagnostic EKG changes, or specific imaging findings. Why are we making this switch? So what is the rationale for this transition and why now? The transition will align the New Haven Health with the 2021 American College of Cardiology Chest Pain Guidelines and 2020 ESC ACS Guidelines. This transition will standardize troponin measurement across all of Yale New Haven delivery networks. This will improve our ability to detect myocardial injury with the caveat that specificity is lower, leading to detection of all forms of myocardial injury, including non-ischemic myocardial injury in addition to type one and type two MI. Interpretation will require a careful analysis of all clinical data to classify type of myocardial injury. This transition will improve ED throughput through rapid exclusion of myocardial injury in many patients. And finally, our lab vendor at several delivery networks is no longer supporting fourth generation troponin testing we have enough reagent to continue performing fourth generation testing at these delivery networks through the first week of February. This has led to our compressed time frame. Our current go live date is February 3rd, 2022. With that introduction, I will turn the floor over to Dr. Joe Elkuri. Dr. Elkuri. Thank you, Dr. Posick. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my aim today is to go over two things with you. One is the key differences between the fourth generation cardiac troponin P and the fifth generation, which is summarized on this slide, as well as explaining how the results will show up in our hospital information system, which is EPIC. So in this slide, the manufacturer is summarizing the key differences between the fourth gen and fifth gen. I just want to draw your attention to three key messages here. One is the measuring range. We are able to go down, as the name implies, it's a higher sensitivity assay, so to lower levels. And that is down to six nanograms per liter in this case, as compared to 0.01 nanogram per mil, which used to be the equivalent of something around 10, if you just do the unit conversion, uh, nanogram per liter. 
And uh, so it's very important also to mention another big change you're going to see as looking at these is the units. We're going to be moving from nanogram per ml. So you're used to seeing the lower limit being 0 0.01 nanogram per ml to now it's nanogram per liter. So that's a thousand fold change. So now we're only going to be reporting uh, uh, basically full numbers. So it's, you're going to see six, seven, eight. You're not going to see those uh, decimal points anymore. So that change should reinforce uh, that this is a high sensitivity assay. So uh, important change to note as you're looking at these numbers and interpreting them. Uh, another key improvement is precision. It's true, this is not in the name. It says it's high sensitivity, but it's also higher precision assay, which is important as I'll explain later. But basically at the threshold that we're looking at here, the uh, 11, five and six using different instruments, we have 10% CVs that equate to almost 30 nanogram per liter if I make the unit conversion on the old assay. That's incredibly high precision. And even in the normal range, we're able to give you results that are uh, very precise and reliable. I'll talk about what that means in a bit. And this just shows in the, on the bottom of the slide, like at the 0.01, which is what we used to detect in our previous cutoff, we're now, uh, if we look at how it changes with sexes, and this varies depending on the population, which is why we won't really be going over that significantly. Uh, you have 19, 14, and 22 for both uh, females and males. And again, that changes by population. And we will be using clinical decision limits as 12, as will be explained later. Moving on to the next slide. So this, again, compares head to head the values of the fourth generation assay to the fifth generation assay. Uh, on top, though, you see the bar which shows you different concentrations of the fourth. On the bottom, you're seeing the fifth. Now, important, this is not a simple unit conversion. On the high end, above 100, the two assays match very well. There's excellent concordance between the two assays. On the low end, you see the values shift slightly. So we just want you to, if you're trying to equate the numbers between fourth and, and fifth gen, the 0.03 that you used to look at is equivalent to around 52 nanogram per liter. And this number will be important in the pathways as will be explained later. And the 0.01, which we used to use for a cutoff as positive is now around 30. And actually 30 doesn't show up anywhere in the pathway because now with the high sensitivity, we can even dig deeper and go down. And that's what you're seeing in the orange and blue uh, colored graphs here, which are showing you, we can go down to 12 nanogram per liter, which is our now new clinical threshold, as we'll discuss, and even going down below that, well within the normal range, down to six nanogram per liter. Moving on to the next slide. So just to explain briefly, what are we gaining from this improved precision, and what does precision versus accuracy even mean? This is a simple graphic representation that we use commonly in lab medicine to explain this to our trainees. And basically, on the left side, you have, if you have higher precision, Precision simply means that the scatter of your data is very close. There is almost no deviation amongst each other, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're hitting the right target. So if you look at the top left of that, this is where you have high precision scenario, but low accuracy. You're not really hitting the bullseye, but all your data points are clustered around each other. That means our instrument is reliably detecting, giving us that value, but it's not quite accurate. And then on the lower right quadrant, if you look at where we have a situation with low precision, but high accuracy, which is what we typically equate the fourth generation with, you're getting a reliable troponin value, but you're not very precise. So it's spreading around your target. So what that means for you is really, you can't tell those small differences that could be happening between those points. Whereas with the fifth generation, now we're gonna have high precision and high accuracy. So as you can see in the top right quadrant, now all the points are clustered around the bullseye. So if I have my patient in the normal range that is now increasing very slightly, we can detect it with the fifth generation and it is clinically significant. It means something. So now we can report deltas and give you that and you could use that as part of the algorithm as will be discussed uh, later on. Moving on to my uh, last slide. Uh, so here, and there's gonna be several uh, screenshots here. So uh, unfortunately, this is not displaying as I intended. This is only showing the last three hour shot, but there's, a, there's gonna be a one, uh, sorry, a baseline, which is zero hour, a one hour and a three hour uh, basically view. So this is the three hour view here. And really all that matters is as you're looking, you're seeing kind of two lines. One is the, th the top one is showing you the top troponin T value. And in this case, we're flagging it at 12. As we said, this is our clinical decision limit. And then if it's less than six, as you see on the far right, uh, that, that was our baseline. And we're also calculating a Delta one hour and a Delta three hour for you. So what you're going to see here is in this example, the Delta three hour, which is specifically stating that it's the three hour from baseline, not from one hour. So if you're ever doing the calculations yourself, which you shouldn't, you should always go back to baseline. And in this case, we're always doing it for you. 
show you it's it's essentially going uh, this is a delta f6 and we'll explain what those mean now two key things to mention here last is one we will not be flagging deltas because those vary by pathway depending on the sample so you will have to pay attention to the delta and two what we consider critical is 100 nanogram per liter so at that point is when we will be calling you uh, other than that all of this should be taken care of through the pathways uh, thank you very much. I'll, I'll be looking forward to taking questions at the end. I'll turn it over to uh, Dr. Fosik. Thank you, Dr. al -Khoury. Dr. Stuzerich will now walk us through some of the fundamentals of high sensitivity troponin interpretation. Thanks, Steve. So it's my pleasure to give you guys some of the clinical background in how we're gonna uh, really blend this clinically with lab medicine. So again, uh, it's really important to realize that in the really vast majority of adults, you're gonna have some detectable high sensitivity troponin. So the key is we wanna really reinforce uh, like we have for years um, and the universal definition. This is a test that was designed for uh, patients with chest pain or chest pain equivalents. So we wanna use it in, in basically in context of a risk stratification uh, model. So we wanna look at our pretest probability disease what are the EKG symptoms? How classic are the, are the um, EKG findings and symptoms? So we're gonna use the modified heart score. We look at history, ECG, age, and risk factors. And then you're gonna incorporate the troponin with that to really give you your risk assessment of really how you're gonna triage the patient. And again, it's going to be really important that you understand both the cardiac and non-cardiac causes and ischemic versus non-ischemic causes because the vast majority of your cases are not gonna be acute coronary syndrome. And like Joe said, because of this precision, we're really going to improve our specificity by looking at one and three hour samples uh, after the baseline to really help us uh, uh, basically risk stratify and triage our patients. Next slide. So if you look at just ambulatory adults in some of the studies, up to 100% of patients have a, a baseline troponin value. So again, the level set with Joe, we're gonna use uh, under 12 as our negative and under six is gonna be our undetectable. 12 to 51 is gonna be our indeterminate zone and above 52 is gonna be our injury zone. So it's not a rule in MI zone. It's a rule that we have uh, injury. And I'm gonna show you, I think a nice algorithm how to go through that in your uh, train of thought. So again, the majority of very lowest patients are gonna have values less than six and some uh, coronary patients will be above our 99th percentile and might have values as you're gonna see maybe 15 or 20. We chose 12 overall to be on the safe side and really look at patiently, basically making sure we're not missing anything in the early days. And our 12 cutoff is the same as all the major academic uh, institutions. And again, the increased sensitivity and precision of this assay is gonna really allow us a lot of very early rule-ins and rule-outs. So by the previous data, about 15 to 25% of people that are low risk can be uh, discharged within an hour or so, and up to 50% can be discharged within three hours. Again, low risk patients with uh, negative, um, both baseline and changed uh, numbers can be uh, discharged and, and really help the ED throughput. Conversely, on the other end of the uh, scale, we're gonna have a lot more of injury diagnosed because of the sensitivity, I'm going to show you how to you know, basically slot that in with the risk factors. And finally, we're going to have the same problem with the old assay as we did with end-stage renal disease. Virtually everyone's going to be positive, and many, many at baseline are going to be over the uh, injury limit. Next slide, Steve. So really, here's, I guess, the money shot. This shows you uh, the, the precision uh, and how quickly you can detect um, uh, early elevations. So you can see the old assay and I think the black, our roaches in the green, but right up there with all the high sensitivities. Within a, a, an hour or two, the area under the receiver operating curve for detecting uh, injury is already at 90 to 95%. That's why when somebody comes in with several hours of chest pain, even early on, you're gonna be right in the money of really where they are. Uh, and you can see that it stays persistently elevated you don't need to see this rise that you usually see over four to six hours with our current assay and catch up later on. Virtually um, uh, everybody within the first several hours is gonna start to show values. And because of the position, this delta is gonna be very, very important. Next slide. 
So again, we're going to follow serial studies, but hopefully for the um, for the rest of our lives, we're not going to trend troponins. Uh, as people at Bridgeport know, this is one of my pet peeves. But the bottom line here is you can tell by this de uh, depiction, whether you have small, moderate, or large increases in troponin, it remains elevated for many days and even acutely for the first several days, even if you have very low elevations. So in fact, once you're done with the three hour, there's no reason to do five, six, seven troponins at all anymore. It doesn't give you any value. But looking at this, you need to understand that if you see an elevated value that's now decreasing, that's also one of your criteria, you may have missed the window and this patient might be presenting later on with their infarct. So you've got to pay attention for a decreasing value also. Next slide. So to see visually, this really, I think, sums it up nicely. When you look at our prior decision limit, which is 0.03 with that 10% uh, CV, we had a sensitivity of only about 35% with a spectacular specificity of 99%. Now, when you go up to our high sensitivity cutoff of 12, you markedly improve the sensitivity, but you're gonna basically sacrifice a little specificity. However, your negative predictive value is still gonna be, I think, spectacular. You can see right there that basically they're all the same but you're gonna suffer your positive predictive value. So again, we use this cutoff of 0.03, which is now our injury limit of 52, but we're detecting well, well below down to six. So we're gonna to have to really understand how to use these low levels and not push the panic button. Next slide. So this I think is really important to understand that elevated troponin, which in the past has been taught as being associated with necrosis, is really not. There's many patterns I'm gonna show you potentially of injury. But again, if you look at what we call the two compartment troponin uh, uh, theory, that you have about six to 8% of your troponin inside the cell circulating as free uh, cytosolic troponin. So anything that interrupts the cell membrane, uh, early cell turnover, you can see a little leakage. And these are responsible for our early troponin releases and are basically day-to-day -day elevation of troponin in our ambulatory population. It's not until you get uh, basically necrosis at this time, and you now have destruction of the contractile apparatus, that you get these delayed and larger troponin rises, which is truly associated with cell injury. So again, in the past, people thought that any elevated troponin meant that there was necrosis. And I think the, the proper term that we're gonna keep using is injury, and then we're gonna have to slot that injury into our new current thinking. Next slide. Um, this is a, a list of um, a purported reasons why we see these troponin elevations both at baseline and with early changes. Some of it may be from my, uh, myocyte necrosis, but again, as you're going to see in some of the studies, only about three out of 100 patients that have troponins drawn in the ED develop an acute coronary syndrome. So what's responsible for the rest? Well, it could be some cell apoptosis. A lot of people think that these low levels in high-risk patients that we see are due to normal myocyte turnover. You can see sometimes with early ischemia, you can get membranous blebs that can release some of the cytosolic um, troponin. So the list does go on and on, but the bottom line is there's multiple mechanisms above and beyond necrosis, which are actually way more common than necrosis, that are gonna cause these elevations, especially in this acute injury pattern. Next slide, Steve. So obviously we're not gonna go over this laundry list, but I think when you're slotting in what these rises are, you really have to have a fairly keen knowledge of what the cardiac and systemic causes of uh, troponin elevation. And remember for a troponin elevation to be called a type two MI, you need both, you need two out of three of the symptoms, EKG changes in troponin. So many of the troponin elevations, we're gonna call acute injury, because they're going to exist by themselves, but not in a category where we would justify an MI versus type one or type two. Next slide. So when you look at the data, how all this is obtained from large samples of healthy individuals and blood donors, I think this gives you a really good visual where the numbers are. So really you can see that the majority of young and healthy patients will be, be below six, you can see there. And that's our basically detecting limit. If you look at 12, which is our normal limit, you're gonna see, again, the vast majority over 99% will be there.
but you see a smattering of 14s up to 2022. So there will be some people that run chronically somewhat above our detection limit. And that's okay. We're really looking again for uh, safety uh, versus specificity uh, very, very early on. But this gives you an idea that virtually none of these people would be at our old um, upper limit uh, cutoff with the precision level of 0.03, which is now about 52 again, to, uh, as a reminder. So we're not gonna say troponin positive, troponinemia. This is basically looking at a value, whether it's changing, what's the absolute in the delta, and what's the clinical scenario. Next slide, please. And I think this is really the, the nice way to um, put things together in your mind, how to look at uh, levels of elevated troponin. And I think it's best to start all the way to the right when you see a chronically elevated troponin, which doesn't meet any of our cutoffs of a delta, which is five at one hour or 10 at three hours, which Steve is gonna explain. So this is chronic injury, okay? There's no, no uh, delta, so there's no acute change. <laughs> the most important one that you see typically is uh, CKD. But you will see this in, again, some structural heart patients uh, that will run chronically elevated above our detection limit. What about when you see an acute rise or fall that's gonna meet our criteria? Well, again, if you don't have EKG changes or chest pain, we call this acute myocardial injury. Again, so everything that's not a heart attack is not a, um, a type two or demand ischemia. And these go into our acute myocardial injury bucket. So here you're gonna see myocarditis, pulmonary embolus. You're gonna see this just uh, very, very uh, frequently in uh, heart failure patients. Uh, let's say a, um, a dilated non-ischemic cardiomyopathy that comes in in a fluid uh, CHF, but it's not going to be uh, demand ischemia or ACS. So your smallest bucket are gonna be the people that do meet um, the definition for an MI. So they come down to either being a type one ACS or type two, uh, uh, a demand ischemia. And at this point, you know the differential diagnosis of that. But the way you're going to look at that is you, your buckets on the, on the right are going to be much, much greater than your buckets on the left. And the next slide, I think, shows that um, uh, what to expect. So this is a good idea, uh, I think, of what we would typically likely see when we launch. This is the Mayo experience in thousands and thousands of patients. So up top on the left, you see the um, uh, fourth, uh, fourth generation troponin and, and what the skew of patients were who came in through the emergency department. And below that, you can see the same thing after their fifth generation launch. So in the blue, when you look at their 0.03 precision limit, in the ED, about 85% of the people were below that 99 percentile cutoff. Now, with a more sensitive test, you only get about 50 to 55% of people in that bucket, which would be your non-ischemic. However, you can see your injury bucket now vastly um, uh, expands with the improved sensitivity and pre precision of the assay. But a lot of it is going to be in this acute injury bucket, which now goes to about 11% to about 38%. So even though your MI bucket, which you can see in green and purple expands, only very, very modestly. So you go from about less than 2% of true ACS to about 3% ACS. And the larger increase in the MI bucket would be type twos, which go to about one and a half percent to a little bit over 5%. So a lot of noise, again, you're gonna see a lot more acute injury, but not necessarily um, acute MIs. And this is really important because as you see, the vast majority of patients are not gonna be an ACS, but are gonna be in high-risk patients with, you can see a laundry list of problems that have caused um, both a baseline and then a changing um, uh, high sensitivity uh, trope value. Next slide. So to show you how sensitive this is, I, I took this as a recent um, uh, um, circulation uh, article which basically took about 34 patients with totally angiographically normal coronary arteries, did a balloon inflation for 30 seconds, which we know should not cause any necrosis at all. And they saw a six-fold increase in troponins, his troponins at uh, three hours. And in fact, long distance running, treadmill exercise, any sort of vigorous exercise will, should be in your differential diagnosis because you will see significant changes in many patients, especially depending on 
how uh, heavy the exercise was that'll get you into the injury um, uh, bucket pretty quickly because that's how sensitive it is in high-risk patients. Next slide. So just to level set in your mind what you're gonna see. So as Joe stated, once you get um, above 100, the, the, the thousand kind of a fold conversion from, the, from nanograms per mil to nanograms per liter will show up uh, very nicely. So to get your, your kind of eyeballs used to it, this is a great slide that shows kind of small, medium, large, and very large um, bumps that you can see. So you can imagine, let's go on the very right. Let's say somebody comes with a STEMI, uh, you open up the LAD, reperfuse the area, you might see basically a 20 or $30,000 uh, 30, uh, nanogram per liter number come back. Trust me, the, uh, the myocardium is not liquefying. This is just a conversion of what you would see before. So typically for a decent size MI and stuff, you're gonna be uh, frequently over that 100 limit, which is our so-called critical alert uh, um, uh, limit that we're gonna send out a, a text or a message to you guys about uh, a high level value. So I think this just gives you um, kind of visually um, uh, some culture shock of what you're gonna see with these crazy high numbers. Next slide. But this is really, I think the beauty of it uh, and our ED colleagues are gonna love it and clear out the, I hope the unit uh, uh, quicker than usual. This is looking at length of stay in hours and it goes into the hospital stay. And you can see the rapid increase in the kind of pinkish, whatever that is, early rule out pathway when you get up to 50% of the people you can see out of the ED here uh, at about three hours. And if you follow that curve down, it just flattens out the whole length of stay in the hospital also. And when you're gonna see the pathways, you're gonna get these values back very, very quickly. So by three hours at max, you should know who needs a cardiology consult, who needs an OBS bed, who needs a unit. So it's gonna actually, I think, increase the throughput through the hospital and decrease our in-hospital length of stay also. Next slide. So I will end with this one uh, and address the, uh, the elephant in the room. Uh, being cardiologists, you guys are all paranoid going, oh my goodness, I'm gonna see all these positive values and our, our utilization of resources is gonna go um, uh, off the charts. And these guys are crazy. It's gonna increase our length of stay. So first, I'm going to show you the second bullet. This is, I'm, this is just basically uh, summarizing a lot of stuff for you guys. But in Europe, with over uh, basically a decade of use, you see that there's a, a neutral effect on resource utilization overall, with, again, about 15% fewer admissions and about a 20% upfront reduction in length of stay in the ED. So then I'm going to contrast that with the Mass General Brigham and Mayo rollouts. And you can see in a huge number of patients in Boston, that the utilization of high sensitivity troponin increased um, utilization of ECGs and lab testing, but paradoxically decreased stress testing, CTA and cath or PCI use. And again, did show that uh, shorter length of stay. Conversely, the Mayo stress testing and length of stay was reduced, but in that, in that study, uh, angiography was slightly increased. And I think even more importantly, if you did not have a uh, high sensitivity troponin elevation, uh, in the ED, discharge in, um, increased, and the utilization of resources from the um, ED through a chest pain unit like yourself in Yale was markedly decreased. So I think properly done, I think this is going to be a welcome addition um, uh, to our armamentarium, and I'll uh, uh, send everything back over to Steve. Thank you, Dr. Zarich. In our last 15 or 20 minutes, I will walk you through the care signature pathways for the evaluation of chest pain. These pathways were created by a multidisciplinary team representing all delivery networks with representation from lab medicine, emergency medicine, nursing, internal medicine, and cardiology with input from Emory Healthcare, UT Southwestern, partners in Boston, and the Cleveland Clinic. These pathways represent a hybrid of our literature review and discussions with other academic healthcare systems. Numbers you need to know, and this has been alluded to earlier in today's talk, for ease of use and improved sensitivity, Yale New Haven Health has chosen a non-sex specific upper limit of normal below the Roche established cutoffs reviewed previously. This is in keeping with other academic medical centers such as partners in the Cleveland Clinic. So the critical numbers are that a value of less than six is undetectable. This is gonna be important for our patients in the ED pathway who are ruling out quickly. 
a value of less than 12 is considered normal. A value between 12 and 51 is considered abnormal but indeterminate or intermediate for ischemia. Change from baseline and clinical picture are critical for interpretation in this group. Values of greater than or equal to 52 nanograms per liter are considered abnormal. And we put the rule in zone here in quotation marks as Dr. Zarich alluded to earlier. This is really myocardial injury. And this correlates to a fourth generation troponin T of 0.03 nanograms per ml. There's an important note on the bottom of this slide that Dr. Zarich alluded to earlier as well. And that is that values of greater than or equal to 100 nanograms per liter change or rise or fall of greater than or equal to 10 nanograms per liter or doubling of HS troponin on serial samples more strongly suggests ischemia. And in fact, when you start getting to values of 100 and over, you're looking at a positive predicted value increasing to up to 70% from the slide Dr. Zarek showed you earlier where those lower numbers had more of a 38% specificity. The ED chest pain pathway is based on an extensive literature review, as I mentioned earlier, as well as our discussions with other academic centers. We sought to maximize sensitivity while allowing early discharge for appropriate low-risk patients with undetectable high sensitive neutroponin. We have included a zero hour only option for such patients with symptoms lasting for greater than or equal to three hours and a low-risk modified heart score of less than or equal to three. This score would translate to an equivalent non-modified heart score as the troponin value would be calculated at zero in the setting of an undetectable HS troponin. We chose the modified heart score as a clinical decision tool based on our desire to encourage early risk assessment to help guide high sensitivity troponin ordering. This approach has been used successfully at UT Southwestern with excellent safety data, which I'll show you in a moment. The ED chest pain pathway incorporates clinical history, EKG, and lab data, as well as a modified heart score, which does not include troponin. The modified heart score incorporates history, EKG, age, and risk factors. The pathway uses a zero plus minus one plus minus three hour protocol with each subsequent troponin ordered by reflex based on value or delta. Our goal is to identify low risk patients with a less than 1% 30 day MI or death rate who are safe for discharge. We anticipate, as Dr. Zarich alluded to earlier, that greater than 50% of patients will be candidates for discharge after zero and or one hour HS troponins. We want to identify intermediate risk patients who are candidates for observation or a chest pain center and pre-discharge functional or anatomic testing. And finally, we want to identify high risk patients who will benefit from cardiology consultation, admission and further intervention. This is data from UT Southwestern looking at the impact of their high sensitivity protocol on ED discharge observation status and admissions. As you can see in the upper right corner box, more patients were discharged from the ED, fewer patients were admitted, and fewer patients were placed in observation status in the chest pain cohort. Those who ruled out were more likely to be sent home. This is published safety data from the same paper by the UT Southwestern group from its first 10 months, looking at readmissions with MI or death. This data has held up over the last four years. So now we'll turn our attention to the chest pain evaluation adult ED pathway. Entry into the ED chest pain pathway begins with chest pain or chest pain equivalent symptoms. An EKG is obtained. This can be ordered directly from the pathway. All of the blue text that you see on the screen is, uh, represents pop-up boxes, which you can click on for more information. Cardiology is engaged for any diagnostic EKG changes or high clinical suspicion for ACS. The pathway offers a broad differential diagnosis and further guidance regarding history and physical exam to help exclude other potential etiologies of chest pain. A modified heart score is then calculated and high sensitivity troponins are drawn. If the modified heart score is low and symptoms have been present for three hours or more, a zero hour troponin is ordered with a reflex to one hour. If not, a zero and one hour troponin are, are drawn. All troponins will reflex to the next draw if numeric or delta criteria are met. If the HS troponin is greater than or equal to 52 nanograms per liter at any time, the patient moves to the abnormal box for consideration for admission and cardiology involvement. 
follow up one in three hour high sensitivity troponins will be drawn in this group to assist in distinguishing acute from chronic injury. Some patients with underlying medical illness, such as chronic kidney disease, as we alluded to earlier, or heart failure may have high sensitivity troponins in this range in the absence of acute MI. Change from baseline and clinical history are particularly important in such patients. If the initial troponin is undetectable at less than six nanograms per liter, symptoms have been ongoing for three hours or more, and the modified heart score is low risk, the patient is a candidate for discharge without further testing. All others will require a one hour high sensitivity troponin. If the initial troponin is less than 12 nanograms per liter and the one hour change is less than three nanograms per liter, the patient has ruled out at one hour. If the initial value is between 12 and 51 nanograms per liter and there is a change of five nanograms per liter or more at one hour, the patient moves to the abnormal box. All patients with values between 12 and 51 who do not have a one hour change of five or more will have a three hour troponin as will all patients with a baseline value of less than 12 and a one hour change greater than or equal to three. If the three hour change is greater than or equal to 10 nanograms per liter, the patient will move to the abnormal box. If the change is less than 10, the patient has ruled out at three hours. However, those with changes between five and nine nanograms per liter are candidates for chest pain center observation or admission for pre-discharge functional or anatomic testing as are higher risk patients with a change of less than five nanograms per liter. Please pay careful attention to the group that rules out at three hours. This group has a significantly higher one-year mortality than the group that rules out at zero or one hour. In fact, it's closer to the group that winds up in the abnormal box. We'll now turn our attention to the adult inpatient pathway. The inpatient chest pain pathway is for use with inpatients on the floor or ICU. It is not for use with ED patients and does not include a modified heart score. Do not order high sensitivity troponin if there is no chest pain, chest pain equivalent, or concerning EKG change. All patients will have a zero and one hour HS troponin drawn with a reflex to a three hour HS troponin pending results. When compared to the ED pathway, the one hour delta cutoff increases to greater than or equal to 10 nanograms per liter in keeping with the Cleveland Clinic intubation pathway and our ability to capture patients with a delta of five to nine and still rising with a three hour HS troponin. Criteria for entry into the inpatient pathway is chest pain or chest pain equivalent in an inpatient. An EKG is obtained in all. Cardiology is engaged for ST elevation, ischemic EKG changes, or high clinical suspicion. Again, do not order a high sensitivity troponin if there is no complaint of chest pain, chest pain equivalent, or concerning ECG change. All, patient, all inpatients will have a zero hour and a one hour HS troponin drawn. If the HS troponin is greater than or equal to 52 at any time, myocardial injury is documented and further evaluation is warranted. A reflex one and three hour troponin will be obtained to evaluate change from baseline and help discriminate acute from chronic injury. If the initial high sensitivity troponin is less than 12 and the one hour change is less than three, acute myocardial injury is excluded. If the change is greater than or equal to three, but less than 10, or the initial troponin is between 12 and 51, a three hour HS troponin is obtained. If there is a change of greater than or equal to 10 at one hour or three hours, the patient moves to the myocardial injury box. If the change is less than six, the patient moves to the no acute myocardial injury box. If the change is between six and nine, the patient should be considered in a higher risk group with further follow-up and testing potentially indicated. This is a very nice slide courtesy of Abigail at Emory Healthcare, um, which helps us conceptualize the various forms of myocardial injury. It's similar to the slide that Stu showed earlier. Although it is quite busy, it highlights the paradigm shift required with the introduction of HS troponin. We are transitioning from a conceptual framework of rule in and rule out to myocardial injury or no myocardial injury, followed by further characterization as ischemic or non-ischemic myocardial injury, either acute or chronic. In conclusion, this is a major shift in how we approach the diagnosis of myocardial injury. This is not simply a change in a lab test. 
There is no false positive high sensitivity troponin. There may be no evidence of ischemia or acute MI, but any value above threshold represents myocardial injury of some form across a broad spectrum. Most type one acute MIs will have HS troponin values and deltas well above the thresholds discussed today. There will be a learning curve as we become comfortable interpreting intermediate or indeterminate values and put them into clinical context. The care signature pathways attempt to provide a framework for interpretation of high sensitivity troponin. The goal of the pathways is to identify patients at very low risk for early ED discharge to risk stratify intermediate risk patients who may require pre-discharge functional or anatomic testing, and to identify high-risk patients who require further evaluation and management of possible acute ischemia. We will be following a detailed dashboard for these pathways and will adjust both pathways as needed based on monthly reviews of all available data, as well as feedback from frontline clinicians. This is really an introduction and a first step in this transition, and this will take time. Um, we have actually left a fair amount of time for questions in anticipation of, of a number of questions. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. And we're happy to answer any questions that people have. ask, what is the uh, role of the high sensitivity troponin if somebody presents, let's say, 48 hours after a suspected acute MI, let's say they, they present with an abnormal EKG, the history is chest pain, diaphoresis two days earlier, and they have mild heart failure. Can we use this test to confirm a suspicion? Yeah, I think we can. If you look at the slides, it's due, show, um, it's due can address this question as well. When you look at how long those HS troponins are stay up and you look at the values that we obtain when people have a significant injury, we can still use those as well as potentially a fall if there is a fall over time, um, just like we used our traditional troponins. I mean, I think we're still also going to be looking at other data like echocardiography to see if there are new regional wall motion abnormalities, et cetera. Um, uh, Stu, I will uh, defer to you as well if you want to answer it as well. No, I agree. At, at 48 hours, there still should be a significant uh, elevation off that we really should be seeing, uh, you know, the, the effects, even with a slight decrease in there, it should give you a good idea. Again, with the proviso, though, let's say they had rapid AFib and went into see, you know, it could still be, you know, significantly in the injury level and not be an ACS. So, you, you know, you, you're going to have to put together all the clinical pieces. Hi, this is Bob McNamara. Uh, I have a question where does stress testing fit into this? I mean, currently when you roll out in the chest pain center, they get a stress test. Uh, here you're talking a lot about discharge. Uh, when is it, is there gonna be a intermediate range where people can be comfortable uh, sending for stress tests, uh, whether it's right from the ED or uh, as a early discharge? So I, I think as the pathways suggest in these patients who are in the intermediate or indeterminate groups, um, there is a subset of those patients who have a troponin change that doesn't meet our full criteria, who are gonna head for the chest pain center or have and have either functional or anatomic testing performed pre-discharge. And I think we'll continue to use our clinical judgment for higher risk patients. Really the high sensitivity troponin allows us to get those very low risk patients out of the hospital without further evaluation. We have to continue to use our clinical judgment. Uh, one of the, the data pieces that uh, from the Brigham and partners group that um, student show in his slide, but the, that is in their nice paper in Jack from June of 2021, looks at actually a decrease in their use of stress testing um, with the advent of high sensitivity troponin. Um, and I think we will see some of that. Yeah, I chime in, Bob, I think, you'll have confidence with that delta that you may not have had before. So you, if you see like a borderline number and there's absolutely no delta, you might wanna um, kind of send them home without the stress test. Um, and that's why we flagged between six and nine, um, uh, three hour delta, 
you know, kind of didn't make 10, but that might be somebody you're thinking about uh, is a little high risk, just kind of missed it. So you might want to, you know, send them and do your, you know, send them to the chest pain center, do your stress test. What's the real role of the chest pain unit if you've ruled out the MI with that uh, three hour test? Um, if you have somebody with an intermediate risk that you are not comfortable sending home, why not do a stress test right at that point and not have a chest pain center? So you could, uh, you could do that. You could get a, a stress test or a CTA. I think two things are going to happen. You're not going to have any low, low risk people in there that you might've just got a stress test, you know, just to make everybody feel better. Cause I think you should have confidence in the low risk patient that, you know, um, uh, is within 12, et cetera. Those people go out, but I think nothing changes for the intermediate pa patient. Cause you know, you're going to have your, you know, your history, your EKG chains, et cetera, whatever you're thinking. And you're going to use your clinical acumen and, you know, put those in there if you think they need an early evaluation. So I think the big difference is, is basically who you can get home right away, who you can send home, I think a little bit more comfortably without an immediate stress test. Um, and everybody else in the gray zone is going to be, I think, a chest pain kind of center type of person you probably wanted to either do a, um, a stress test or something on, or you might want to send them to OBS. But so what's the purpose of additional observation in a chest pain center. Um, either you feel comfortable sending the patient home or you really want a test before discharge. Why not directly send the patient to the test, whether it's a CTA or a functional test and get the answer and then you send the person home or not at six hours rather than the following day. Why does somebody have to spend the night in, in the hospital? Yeah, I, I think that becomes more of a logistics question, Arthur, about availability of beds and what the chest pain center beds are used for. You're right. We're not going to have to have patients in the chest pain center for six hours for a rule out anymore. Um, it may act more as a holding point for getting patients to their functional and anatomic testing. Uh, I, I absolutely see what you're saying. Uh, Erica has a question in the chat about the prognosis of people with myocardial injury without obvious mechanism and how we are planning to communicate this uh, to our patients. Um, and that's an excellent question. Uh, Stu and I can both take a shot at that. And, and I think it depends uh, in part on the level of myocardial injury we're talking about. So if you look at patients in the intermediate group and there's some data from I believe it was Merlin to me, 36, that looked at this. Um, but if you look at patients who have a, a normal fourth generation troponin and abnormal high sensitivity troponin, so you're talking about patients who are between the six nanogram per liter and 30 nanogram per liter point, those patients definitely have a higher mortality at one year. Um, the data, I believe it was 3.8 to 7% um, in that population. Uh, patients who have HS troponins of over 52, and as you go on up the scale, you know, you have the typical troponin progression. The higher your troponin, the, the worse your prognosis is over a long time for, you know, MACE for major adverse cardiovascular events. Um, the issue of how we communicate this to patients is one that we've been debating at the steering committee level um, and how we're going to message this with lab results. Um, we're trying to craft a careful statement that talks about um, what these values mean and the importance of clinical context. Um, but I, I also think it brings up an important point, which is that it's going to behoove us to try to figure out what the source of myocardial injury is in these patients when it's possible. Uh, I'll turn it over to Stu if he has further input. Yeah, just quickly, Eric, I would say that the same patients you saw before you knew the sensitivity of the troponin. So whereas any elevation troponin usually has some prognostic um, information, as we know, uh, I'm not sure you're going to want to tell everybody and um, uh, get them too upset about it. So it's gonna, I think it's going to be an individual um, uh, decision. On the other hand, you could use it as a weapon to get people to do more guideline-directed medical therapy and say, listen, you have this low-grade abnormal, you're in a slightly higher risk group. I think, but I, I think again, you're going to have to you know, put these very low levels um, into clinical um, context and then do you make your best judgment. 
Hi, this is Phil. I was hoping to ask a quick question on the implementation of this. Um, is this similar talk going to be given to other services, including the, the residents, the medical service, and the surgical services? And the reason why I ask this is because I think for the majority of uh, the people that call us, they see troponin as a almost like a binomial result, either positive or negative. And I think it's going to take a huge culture shift to change that. And I just, given that uh, kind of algorithm you have, I maybe I'm a pessimist, but I just see most people just calling cardiology instead of step by step following that and being, oh, I feel comfortable, you know, doing X, Y, Z as the algorithm recommends. So, Phil, to answer your question, I, I gave them I gave them all your number right out right off the bat. <laughs> <laughs> We actually have a very broad educational effort going on. So I've already done grand rounds for the hospitalist team uh, at YNHH. I'm doing it with the hospitalists at um, LMH tomorrow. We have a broad effort with all the EDs. Um, we're meeting with the house staff at uh, uh, YNHH, SRC, Bridgeport, and Greenwich Hospital for Internal Medicine. This will be presented at the faculty meetings for internal medicine and for surgery. There's a 10 minute educational video that I recorded that should only be watched with heavy caffeination available. Um, but that's going to be available to everybody and a link um, is going to be sent out to all staff um, to go through that. There'll be there are a couple of frequently asked questions sheets, uh, both for nursing and clinicians that will be available uh, both online and linked to the pathways. Um, you're right, it's going to require a very broad educational effort to get people thinking about things in a more sophisticated way. And we are likely to see more phone calls to cardiology in the beginning. Um, the reassuring data from other academic medical centers and Rohan can speak to this having come from UT Southwestern where he was a, a fellow during this change. Um, ultimately, uh, the data suggests that you will not see an increase in cardiology consults or cardiology admissions. And the Brigham and Women's data actually agrees with that as well. Um, so, you know, the number of people who are now ruling out more effectively um, will hopefully offset those indeterminate values that people are gonna get anxious about. And I think messaging this, this value of 100 as a, as a critical value and more predictive of, of ischemia and getting people to think more broadly about the concept of myocardial injury being ischemic or non-ischemic are really important messages. And we will be working very hard to get that message out to everyone. I mean, if you look at data, for instance, in, in vascular surgery patients, so patients after vascular surgery, 45% of them have elevated high sensitivity troponins. Uh, if you look at patients in ICUs, any ICU, if you've been in, IC, in an ICU for 12 hours, your chances of having an elevated high sensitivity troponin are probably 35%. So the clinical context in which we, we check these uh, lab tests is going to be even more important than it has been previously. And that's why we've tried so hard to message in the inpatient pathway in particular that you should not be checking high sensitivity troponin unless you have a good reason to check it. I would just add, we're looking for you guys to be the, the glue uh, to that educational message about really, you know, what it means, uh, you know, drawing it in the right context and, and kind of basically uh, uh, shedding some guiding light because I think it's going to be very tough. And we're really focusing a lot on the house staff um, and the hospitalists, as uh, Steve said. There, there is a question about... Um, this lecture being recorded next time it's given so the video link can be sent to everyone. And uh, yes, this actually is recorded and is gonna be available on YouTube, uh, on the Yale Cardiology YouTube channel. Um, and that link can certainly be sent out system-wide, we, we plan to. Um, uh, Erica also makes a point about um, the strong evidence base for shared decision-making and we do have um, comments about shared decision-making specifically within the pathway. Um, the old shared decision-making tool that was, uh, that was available that came out a few years ago does not use high sensitivity troponin. So it was, we, we left it out as, as not applicable, but certainly we always need to engage patients in this discussion. Um, and I think be transparent in, um, in how we are, how we are approaching it. Steve, I was wondering if you thought about having a script 
to use with my chart messages because I can just imagine the onslaught of uh, digital questions from patients having seen a slightly abnormal lab value. Yeah, we are working on a script. And it, it'll be similar to what Stu mentioned earlier, which is that these values are along a spectrum and uh, a lot of people without heart attacks can have abnormal um, high sensitivity troponin values and, and, and talking about the possibilities, but also refer, referring folks back to their clinician. Um, and obviously we have to put all these values into clinical context, um, but. And I'm hoping they don't flag anything over uh, under 52 is red. Uh, I don't know how they're gonna see it, but we really, that's a great question. We have to make sure. Yeah, we, we are currently discussing work. that. We're currently discussing that in our meetings with, with lab medicine. But we also need to be transparent. We don't want patients to feel deceived either. So it's a, it's a fine line. Um, there's a question uh, about delta between one hour and three hour. If this is in the intermediate range, is there a role for trending troponin? You know, really after the three hour troponin, there, there really is not a role to continue trending. You should have come up as much as you need to. Um, the only time where I could see that being an issue is if someone had recurrent symptoms um, in the process of this, you know, zero, one, three hour time. So if someone had recurrent severe chest pain at two hours, uh, you might be thinking about getting another value. Um, but that would really, you know, sort of be restarting the baseline almost. So in general, we're not going to be trending beyond this three hour mark. One other important point that's on the frequently asked questions sheet is uh, what happens if we draw the one hour troponin at an hour and 45 minutes or the three hour troponin at three hours and 45 minutes or four hours. And in general, we're gonna be treating troponins drawn after one hour, but before three hours as a one hour and after three hours uh, as a three hour. And hopefully we're gonna be getting these within you know, an hour of their actual draw time. The bigger danger is accidentally drawing them too early and that's been messaged very clearly to phlebotomy and, and, and to nursing. Um, we wanna make sure that, that we're, we're capturing folks where they're at that point of the curve that's too pointed out where you've got a high percentage of patients who will have already made troponin if they're going to. We've got a lot of questions in the chat, so I'll do my best. Um, What is the suggested response to calls regarding troponins drawn outside of the chest pain algorithm? Uh, very good question. Um, I think that is a complicated, uh, that's a complicated question. And that's in fact, when we initially talked about this transition, we talked about only being able to order high sensitivity troponins from within the pathway um, to avoid this very uh, issue. Um, for, for various reasons, um, we've, you will be able to order uh, troponins. In the hospital, you will, in the inpatient side, the order will be a zero and one hour order. So trying to get away from that errant one troponin that gets people into trouble. <clears throat> and then if we do have the zero and one serial, we'll use the inpatient pathway or the whoever is ordering the troponin will be directed to that pathway. And if not, we would use it as the consulting folks. Um, Eric has a statement um, here about the live dashboard. Yes, so there will be it's actually a very large dashboard that's now being created with JDAT to allow us to review behaviors and to nudge people in the right direction and help people get get into the get into the swing of this. And as I mentioned before, one of the wonderful things about these care signature pathways and the platform we use, which is Agile MD, is that they're very nimble. We can adjust these uh, as needed if our sensitivity is too high or too low, if there are um, further wants or asks from frontline conditions. There's actually a lot of information on the pathways that I did not cover in the interest of time. All of the blue text um, are pop-ups 
there are more discrete pop-ups regarding CKD and end-stage renal disease on both pathways to help guide interpretation of values in that patient population. Um, and there's all, there are also pop-ups about sort of what's changed in the era of high-sensitive butroponin and the 2021 chest pain guidelines. I think we're, we're a little bit over time. When Steve, um, <laughs> one of our fellows asked about the COVID patients. Uh, we haven't really talked about them yet, but we, we should discuss potentially uh, if troponins are going to remain in our algorithm, we've got to probably level set what values we're going to consider um, in that population. So, you know, there, there's been a lot of debate about this in the literature, and I actually spoke to the teams at Emory and um, UT Southwestern about this a few days ago. Um, they do not provide specific guidelines on a high sensitive troponin level. Their, their point was don't check it unless you're worried about an AMI or you're worried about uh, a potentially a PE. And PE is another important group who we periodically <laughs> check troponins in um, to help risk stratify. 14 has generally been the cutoff that uh, trends well with prognosis with pulmonary embolism, although <clears throat> we, there really isn't an established cutoff that pushes us towards intervention in those patients. If you talk to the Cleveland folks, um, they have not come up with a number either. They actually want to work with us to try to look at all of our data on pulmonary embolism and together come up with some concrete guidelines. But, you know, this has really been rolled out in the U.S. in the last couple of years at academic medical centers. UT Southwestern was one of the first. Um, the Roche assay was FDA approved in, in, in 2017. Um, partners Cleveland, other places have transitioned over 2018, 2019. Emory just did it three weeks ago, uh, no, September, sorry, end of September. Um, so there's a lot of data we still need to gather. And I think um, with pulmonary embolism and, and with COVID, we really need to continue to think about the full clinical picture and use this as part of that risk stratification. And we'll, we'll be happy to, to, there will be several town halls uh, over the next few weeks that'll, that'll be done to address further questions. Um, and you can feel free to contact any of us as well if you have any other questions. And this will be an ongoing educational effort and um, really appreciate all your time and attention and, and excellent questions today. Stu any, and Joe, any, any other comments before we finish? No, I just want to uh, thank you, Steve. I think Steve did an unbelievable job shepherding everybody through this. It was really a yeoman's task. So, same. Thank you all. There's there's one last question here from um, Dr. Galagos about uh, can there be a stop message or alert asking something like does your patient have chest pain or antral equivalent? Um, we've debated that. We'll 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 continue to discuss that. Um, this is sort of the same ideas as limiting ordering to the pathways. This becomes more challenging when you interact with folks outside of cardiology, I can, I, I can tell you that. And we'll be talking about um, an entire healthcare system and wanting to um, please all our stakeholders as best we can. There are some compromises that one winds up making. Right. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you for, for having us. Have a great day. Thanks, all. Thank you.